Supreme Court that you got. You're going to get the kind of four different positions on civil rights that you get from them. You're going to get tax breaks for the wealthy. You're going to get a guy that doesn't know what a grocery store scanner is and everything else, okay? So let's go. We got, you know, we got six more days to go. And don't forget who the real enemy is in here. And don't forget what we really campaign against. Thank you all very much. There it is, James Carville, 92 New Hampshire. You remember that? Yeah, how can I ever forget it, man? <laughs> I, I got to say, I was a little old message, though, wasn't I? <laughs> hey, you had some fire. I would say there are a lot of people who think the Democratic Party should go your way, uh, the strength, vigor, and clarity you spoke with. But we have all kinds on this program, as you know, James. But uh, we Good. have a special place in our political heart for you. I'm really glad that you, you agreed to join us uh, here on our first show since the big results came in. Uh, I just walked through briefly uh, some of what Trump achieved and failed to achieve last night. Uh, right. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, let's continue your agrarian education. In terms of Haley and DeSantis, every dog but the lead dog has the same view. All right, mm. that, this, you got to remember that. And secondly, I think that you made the money point. It was a 30-point win, there's no doubt, that, but he's an incumbent slightly over 50. In 1968, which unfortunately I'm old enough to remember, <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, uh, Jim Carter got 42% in New Hampshire, and Lyndon Johnson had to get out of the race. Mm. All right, Th this is a, not a particularly, in, if, Biden, let's, 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 wait, if Biden had a contested primary or caucus and he got 51, it would be the end of days. It really would, mm. just like it was the end of days for, for Lyndon Johnson. So I, 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 you made the point. I got seven texts last night, even on this network this morning. Uh, uh, Joe Scarborough made the same point, and I think that's a, a, a relevant point. It, it really yeah, is. Let, it, it's, let's share the let's share the credit. Uh, Joe mentioned it. He's got history as a Republican. You mentioned right. it. You're known as a you know I'm generalizing, but you're known as a, a more right. indie centrist Democrat than a super lefty Democrat. Uh, Lawrence O'Donnell. Uh, who talks about his progressive experience. He mentioned it. I mean, everybody around this is thinking about it because you're supposed to do better than that, and Trump is the most famous, oversaturated, controversial, endlessly in the, in the press, especially right wing. I mean, those folks are, are, are tuned into that. And 49% in this reddest of red evangelical states say, I'm still looking. I'm still looking for something else. Right. That doesn't mean that he'll stop them in the primary. It just means he has a base problem. And we hear so much uh, propaganda of the opposite point. So I want to build on this, play some Lawrence to you. So we went Joe to James to Lawrence and then back to James. Here's how LOD put it last night. Donald Trump, whatever he gets tonight, is going to be the lowest margin in the history of Iowa caucuses by someone who has already been president. <laughs> what is the actual biggest margin? It was Tom Harkin. In 1992, 76%. But uh, Trump is not going to set any kind of meaningful yeah. statistical record. This is, in effect, an incumbent Republican president who finds himself in an Iowa caucus. And so, uh, he, he, why can't he hit Harkin-like numbers? Question for you, James, and I'll tell you the headline on the screen, right? Let's forget for a moment which party, which president. Uh, right. Let's forget even the other problems Trump has, which we've recovered. The headline on the screen is, ex-president only wins half of his party's votes in Iowa. James? Well, I mean, that's relevant. And, and Lawrence is like me. He's old in dirt. And <laughs> he, he has a memory uh, of this stuff. And you, you, you can't discard it. And if you look at the uh, called entrance polls, I guess they call them. There's a good part of their party that is uncomfortable with, with Trump as their nominee. Now, there's a good part of the Democratic Party that's uncomfortable with Biden. It's, yep. it's, it's going to be a, a topsy-turvy election, I, I promise you. We're, we're, we're barely out of the—we're not even out of the first inning yet. I, that, that I'm sure of. But the results last night, I, I think, need context, and they need a closer look. And when they do, they're much less impressive— than, than they seem at first. Yeah, interesting. And as you know, in the first inning in a baseball game, uh, if you're not in the lead, you're one of the dogs looking at the other dogs. That's <laughs> Yeah, you got the same view. <laughs> that's what I know about dog baseball. Uh, let me, <laughs> you said a closer look. Well, we set aside time to do this with you, sir. Here's, here's some data points as well. And Steve Kornacki and others went through some of this last night. Interesting. Over 60% 
of these Iowa caucus goers who have a college degree, they turned on Trump. Similar number among the caucus goers who say they're independents, even though they participated. Uh, those are camps that we know were helpful to Biden's victory in 2020. James stays with us, but I'm going to show that Trump also benefits from the splintered opposition, which is an echo of 16. So if you look at this, in the end, he pulled less than half of Republicans who voted in the 16 primaries. The difference then as a non-president was he also lost 13 states. We don't know if that'll happen this time. Uh, we have three candidates going to New Hampshire. 50 percent of Republican voters there, like Iowa, are still mulling the alternatives. Uh, and the other difference, James, is that Cruz uh, hit Trump earlier and harder throughout. Um, I just showed Haley saying it's a Trump-Biden nightmare. Well, she's trying to position herself as the sort of new school, younger alternative to an old style politics. I don't think that's a totally off base message. I, we've seen that play out in past campaigns. Um, but to combine Trump and Biden into the nightmare, you know, it doesn't really wash because Republicans don't agree with half of it. Democrats don't agree with half of it. Um, she's never gone near where Cruz did in going directly at Trump. Well, you know, when you come in third, you got to say something. It, it may not be perfect. And she is trying to position herself. You have an electorate that doesn't, not crazy about either one of the two presumptive nominees of the party. Yep. And she's trying to position herself as something different. Look, she's not going to win. But she has to, what can she do? She said, I came in third. I, I, she's got a soldier on here. She's got Chris Sununu uh, out there. He's, he's way out. He's trying to, to come back and be more friendly to Trump, which I thought was a little disappointing. But you, in, in politics and everything else, if things go bad, you don't always have a good answer. Sometimes you just come up with the best answer you can have. And by the way, in terms of Kornacki, that guy ought to get an Emmy. I mean, I don't know why they have that, but when he does his stuff, I, 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 I find it totally informative and totally entertaining. Do you think he's, uh, this is what we call a leading question, do you think he's sharper than the old days where it was kind of a lot, 30 years ago, you know, there's a lot of numbers running around. That guy, he, Kornacki, whenever we look over at him, he is in, he is in and on it. Yeah, but I mean, he's locked in and he's got the advantage of, of getting instant information. Uh, I think he does very well. I always enjoy him on election night. I always learn something. And, uh, so, you know, they, they, sometimes these guys break the numbers down too much about the number of people that voted in 2020 and didn't vote in 2024 or did and comparing some, some arcane stuff. But at the end of the day, the headline number is, you know, former Republican president gets 51 in a hard rate red state, which has a... a, a one of the oldest populations of any state in the union, you would think that's almost tailor-made for Trump to do really well. Yeah. And, and he did well enough, but not, not, not totally impressive. Yeah, well, you mentioned your age, James. You brought it up. Uh, you, oh, yeah. I believe, compared yourself to the age of dirt. Fact check. Right. The majority of the dirt on planet Earth is older than you. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember when, with Trump and election deniers all over the messaging and the ticket... Uh, the Republicans blew what was supposed to be a huge lead in the 22 midterms. I'm old enough to remember when Trump got 7 million fewer votes in 2020. I'm old enough to remember uh, when they got routed in 2018. And I'm even old enough, James, believe it or not, to remember in 2016 where, fair and square, they eked out the Electoral College. That's the system. But it's not like he ever won the argument. He was 3 million shy of Hillary Clinton with a lot of turbulence at the end, including James Comey, comey -ing. And we're not even going to, we don't have time to get into that. You know how Comey right. Comey's. And Comey's going to Comey. Right. He's just out of power right. now. So, so with all that said, there are Republicans who, even in their information filter, and even with the lies, and this is what you and I are discussing happened last night, who are looking around going, even if they are inclined, James, to think that Trump got a, quote, raw deal, or that there has, quote, been a witch hunt. That doesn't mean they think he's viable to win next year. And boy, do they want to win. They believe Biden is beatable, potentially with another candidate, which is super interesting. And I know you look at the real politics, not the spin. Here's just one voter, as we listen to voters, talking to Shaq Brewster about whether Trump's viable. Who are you leaning towards? Uh, I'm leaning towards Nikki Haley. Why Nikki Haley? Um, I think she's our best candidate right now. I think she's got momentum. And I think absolutely she could probably win the, win the state here. Any chance that you support the former president? No. Why not? I, I don't like him. I don't like the way he, uh, he conducted his presidency, and I just uh, don't think he's a good, viable candidate. James. 
So I want to make a, a, a really point here that is important. Since August of 2022, we literally, Democrats have literally not lost an election. All right, understand that. Tonight, there's a special House race in Florida. I think it's like House District 35. It's a state House race. It's a swing district. Only you Take and Steve knew that it. number, but go ahead. Then you have New York 3, the Santos District, is coming up in February. That's a swing district. I think we're going to win both of them. I think that, not because of anything else. We don't lose elections. We haven't lost any elections since Dobbs to speak of. And when we lose, we perform in eight points better. Says the so abortion me, ruling, yeah. Right. To me, more than pundits and polling, it's really election returns, which I think tends to be the most undercover aspect of, of this business other than election night. Yeah, we have an election night, and then we go back and we have a four-person panel that tr scratches their thin chins and pontificates. That is not anywhere near as important is what voters say when they go out and vote. Hey.